All right, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. I hope y'all are having a good day. It's a gray day here where I am in Kernersville, North Carolina at my house. Um, so I hope you guys are, are cozied up or that you're um, in the office and uh, being really productive. And I hope you're all safe and well. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, since it's one o'clock, I'm gonna go ahead and get started um, on some of our introduction information and uh, you all can get settled and comfortable while I'm doing that. So uh, thank you for joining today's webinar, uh, Recycling Resilience, MRF and Collection Safety During COVID-19. Uh, this webinar is being brought to you, if you can go to the next slide, uh, Marissa. It's being brought to you uh, in partnership with the Carolina Recycling Association, the South Carolina, um, South Carolina DHEC, North Carolina DEEKS, and Renew by RRS. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Renew, it is a new initiative that's connecting industry-led investments and community decision makers to improve recycling systems and build circular economies. So we like that. Uh, for more information on Renew, you can visit their website at www.renew-recycling.org. Renew-recycling.org. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank our wonderful, wonderful CRA sponsors who uh, help us have events like this year round. Uh, we could not do uh, what we do without you all. So thank you so much. And, um, and everyone, please take a look at this list and see who is supporting recycling in the Carolinas and waste reduction in the Carolinas. All right, let's move on to our agenda, a uh, quick overview of our agenda for you guys. So I really uh, wanna go over the purpose of this webinar first and sort of how it came to be. Um, our intention in, in offering it is to be really the first in a series of resilience focused webinars or online forums so that we can discuss in real time the issues that we're facing as an industry related to this pandemic. So there will be opportunities for feedback at the end of this webinar and um, with a post event survey that we will email out after this where you can share with us the additional topics that you would like us to cover on these webinars. Uh, we think all of us in partnership on this webinar think that it is so important to keep uh, communicating with each other about what's going on and that is our intention. Um, but today we wanted to hit the ground running and focus on what we you know and our partners uh, view as the top concern in our industry right now which is uh, health and safety during COVID-19. Um, there have been a lot of webinars lately about COVID impacts and markets and you know viewing recycling as an essential service which we 100 percent agree with um, but we noticed that in many of these webinars there were some key questions that were being asked about health um, that have really been outside of our knowledge base um, with limited resources on this and so you know we we feel the need to ask ourselves what is the actual risk of our activities uh, as they relate to the spread and the prevention of spreading coronavirus? Um, how can we continue to provide waste recycling and diversion programs in a safe way that minimizes or eliminates risk ideally? Are we doing all that we can do and is it truly effective? Um, and lastly, are we communicating to each other and to the public well? And so we have brought to the table a group of leaders and experts in the field, including a, a public health expert um, to try and answer as many questions as, as we can for, for you and for all of us. So, um, so first we will have our state overview with Sandy and Alex from uh, North Carolina and South Carolina respectively. And then we will go into our collection safety panel. Now we are going to deal with recycling collection and other waste diversion collection programs. And we can certainly talk about and take questions about any kind of waste collection, whether it's solid waste, um, landfill bound waste, uh, yard waste, uh, electronics, whatever it is, it all extrapolates to other um, sectors of what we do. So it's it's all open. Um, 
And then uh, after that, we will go into our MRF safety panel um, second. And if we have time at the end, we will uh, take more questions and answers from the audience. So uh, after our good friend, Melissa, I mean, Marissa Segundo from RRS uh, gives us some housekeeping info and walks us through the interactive components of this webinar, which are really fun. I think you're gonna enjoy uh, the interaction that we're gonna provide thanks to RRS uh, helping us with that. Uh, we will go into the, the rest of the agenda. So I'd like to turn it over to um, Marissa now with RRS. The mic is yours, Marissa. Great, thanks Mary, and thank you all so much for joining. We're really excited about this opportunity, as Mary said. So just a couple of housekeeping items. You'll notice that you all are muted, and we don't want that to curtail your voice, so we do want your question and answer. You'll see a little black bar, either on the top or bottom of your screen, and it has a little box that says Q&A. Go ahead and press that and that'll open up a question box where you can at any time throughout this presentation add your questions for the speakers. There'll be two different question times divided as you saw on the agenda in those two pieces. And um, we look forward to answering your questions. Also, if you have any technical questions or issues, you can put those in there and we'll, we'll answer those offline. We will also be providing a recording of this webinar early next week on, um, on either the Renew website or CRA's website. So look, look out for that as well. As Mary mentioned, we like to do interactive polls and have done this pretty, um, pretty effectively in these type of settings. Um, so you can answer in two ways. Um, I'm gonna actually show this one that this shows your entire screen. So since we're mainly on a computer, you can do the easy thing, which is to go to pollev.com slash recycle123 to answer, or you can just grab your phone and you see our sample phone here. You're gonna send a text message to the number 37607. And what you're going to text is the, is the combined word recycle one, two, three. This is not cap sensitive and um, just it needs to be one word recycle one, two, three and press send. Basically, that's just going to open the door to the poll and it'll say that it's not ready yet. But in about 30 seconds or less, when we go to this next panel, you will see that that allows you to be in the poll. So as people are getting in there, I'm going to go through our first poll question, and this is in the form of a word cloud. So I'm going to ask you using one word, or if you have to use two words, you can use in like a underscore or a hyphen, but in one word, what is keeping you going during this challenging time? We're seeing some responses come in, community, passion, people, hope, we need some hope. <laughs> and as more people put in this uh, a, a similar word, you're seeing our cloud grow and we're seeing things like connections, faith, paycheck, <laughs> snacks. Those are good too. Friends, and we'll give about five or more seconds. Hope is still winning. Passion is getting bigger and faith is getting bigger. Community, economy, love. I like that one. The environment. It's the post Earth Day. So that's a good one. Community is still getting big and we're seeing markets and work. So thank you all so much for responding. We'll wrap this one up. I think hope gets to be the winner. Oh, nope. Community one. Good job, community. <laughs> and just to let everyone know, we have 88 people on the call right now. So we're hearing from a lot of different places. So I'm going to switch to a multiple choice question. And this one, you're just going to answer either A, B, C, or D. And the question is, have your operations or collections been disrupted by the pandemic? And if so, what's the, you know, majority of the way? So have you reduced collection services, suspended yard waste, suspended bulk collection, suspended collection of recyclables, or no change, just business as usual, finding, finding homes for our recyclables? hopefully using PPE. All right, so it looks like no change is the clear winner here, followed by suspended yard waste and reduced collection services. So this is good to, good to see where we're at. All right, so now I am going to 
hand the mic over to Sandy and Alex for an update. Okay, let's go. Uh, Sandy, if you could please um, tell us about what is going on from your state, the state level perspective in North Carolina. Uh, how are you doing? How is Deeks doing? How, how are y'all dealing with this? Uh, what is the recycling picture like in North Carolina right now? All right, yeah, thanks, Mary. So um, I'll keep my update kind of big picture about how we've seen COVID-19 impacting recycling in North Carolina, and then I'll let some of our panelists dive into the details about safety. So um, in North Carolina, Governor Cooper declared a state of emergency on March 10th, and then on March 30th, issued the statewide stay-at-home order that runs through April 29th. And in that order, recycling was specifically called out as an essential service to remain in effect. So, you know, during this pandemic, we're really being reminded of how essential recycling is as a feedstock to manufacturers. Uh, many of the products that are in really high demand right now rely on recycling as part of their supply chain. So things like toilet paper, paper towels, the roles that both of those come on, cardboard boxes for e-commerce and home deliveries, um, packaging, you know, glass, plastic, paper, metal packaging for food, cleaning supplies, and medical supplies. And since we have a lot of commercial and industrial facilities that are shut down right now, and we know those are big generators of recyclable material, um, it's even more important that we're still capturing the recyclables that are coming from the residential sector. Um, and just as another reminder, you know, we still have our statewide landfill ban on aluminum cans and plastic bottles. So to our knowledge, um, all of the MRFs in North Carolina are currently operating. So we're not aware of regions that have lost a market for recycling processing. Um, we know of a very small handful of communities, uh, only two for sure, that have suspended, uh, temporarily suspended recycling pickup. But overall, we think the impacts so far have been pretty minimal. Um, you know, we, we recognize that the residential recycling stream is different right now. Uh, since everyone's spending more time at home, they're generating a lot more stuff. So in order to prioritize the management of municipal solid waste and recycling, we've seen many communities adjust the scope of their services and temporarily suspend certain curbside collections like bulky items, yard waste, and electronics. Um, we've also seen drop-off sites limit some of their services, uh, close things like swap shops, waive some of their residential fees to avoid money transfer, um, asking residents to limit trips, all in an effort to keep both their employees and the public as safe as possible. Um, so we've seen some really good communication from our local governments about these service changes. And you know, when you're reaching out to residents with updates, uh, it's also a really good time to remind them what belongs in the recycling bin, because we know that the residential recycling stream is typically the most contaminated. So I'm gonna ask everybody on the call to do one thing, and that is to please make sure that your customers can go to your website and easily find a list, preferably with pictures, of what's accepted in your recycling program. Um, if you need any help with that, please contact us. You know, we have all of our materials from the Recycle Right and See campaign still available. We've got accepted lists tailored to each MRF in North Carolina, so we can quickly send you a simple graphic to use and post. Um, and just a couple other things we're working on at the state. We have some social media posts coming specific to virus-related stuff, like gloves, masks, cleaning wipes, um, just a really simple message that these things belong in the trash and not the recycling bin. So we hope to share those with you soon. Um, we've also got some materials in the works about composting, including a guide to backyard composting, which could be very relevant right now if you're asking residents to hold on to their yard waste for the time being. 
Um, so that's it for me. Um, I'll just end with a huge thank you to everyone on the call and their employees for continuing to show up to work and keeping our recycling programs going. So I'll turn it back to you, Mary. Thank you so much, Sandy. That's great. And I, there's uh, a couple questions coming in, so we will um, get to those after we hear from Alex in case they relate to both of you. So um, Alex, uh, Alex is a local government liaison with South Carolina DHEC. And uh, Alex, why don't you um, give us a quick update about uh, what's going on in South Carolina, please? Hey, great. Hi, everyone. Um, so I've been in contact or trying to keep contact with all the local governments within South Carolina. Um, they've gotten many emails from me week after week um, and just kind of seeing their operations and if there are any disruptions in their operations. Um, for the majority of programs, they're taking the proper precautions that the CDC recommends, social distancing, the proper PPE, frequent hand washing, um, which is great. We've only had from my knowledge, we've only had a couple of programs that have suspended recycling, the curbside recycling, in an effort to focus on trash, uh, which is their which is the um, their main concern right now. A couple have also, similar to North Carolina, um, suspended bulk item pickup, um, either suspended or delayed yard waste pickup, um, and then on our um, drop off site side of things. Uh, some programs have suspended collection of certain materials that reports have come out about the virus living on it longer. So they're trying to prevent that contact that attendants would have, that they sort those materials more frequently, such as plastics, aluminum cans, steel cans, cardboard in some instances. Um, and all of these changes, um, I've been assured, are temporary. But if anything changes, I am trying to keep constant contact with our local governments. Um, similar to North Carolina, our governor put in a stay at home order on April 7th and by law, uh, governor mandates last for 15 days. So he has to go in and make another mandate. Um, and from that, our programs have seen massive amounts of not only uh, trash volume, but also recyclables, yard waste, uh, bulky items, electronics. Um, even in this time of year with spring cleaning, there's always an increase, but with everyone being at home at the same time, it's just twofold. And that is what I'm hearing from across the board. But everyone's keeping it up, fighting the good fight. So I really want to thank all of the local governments in South Carolina. Um, and just, I really appreciate the job you guys are doing. So Mary, I think that's that's about it. Um, Perfect, thank you so much. That is great. So um, we had um, question, a couple questions from the audience and, and we do have time for um, maybe two or, or three questions uh, for you guys right now. And I will be uh, kicking questions to Sandy and Alex throughout the webinar uh, that, that are related to uh, things they need to answer. So, um, but, uh, one of the questions is actually specifically which um, communities have suspended recycling in the two states and uh, why did they make that decision um, if you can shed light on that and I'll start with Sandy um, if you can speak specifically to that. Yeah specifically in North Carolina we know that two communities in the southeast part of the state Hope Mills and Lumberton have temporarily suspended recycling, curbside recycling collection. And my understanding is that they were having a huge problem with contamination, um, trash being put into the recycling bin as an overflow. And so um, in uh, an effort to prioritize getting the municipal solid waste picked up and appropriately, appropriately dealt with, they've tempor temporarily suspended the curbside recycling. Okay, so it's not really related to the um, the uh, health and safety worries, but more just um, contamination for the MRF. So, so the problems we've been having for the last few years kind of exacerbating right now with with more people at home, basically. Mm -hmm. 
Is that your sense of uh, the communities in South Carolina, Alex, uh, as to why they suspended or is it is it different in which communities have suspended in South Carolina? So from my knowledge, it is the city of Orangeburg, city of Sumter and Greater Greenville Sanitation, which services parts of um, Greenville County. Um, they suspended their curbside recycling, um, specifically City of Sumter suspended because their workers do hand sort at the curb. So that was a safety and health precaution on their part. Um, the other two, I believe is one because of um, worker, not worker shortage, but just trying to keep that social distancing. And also in case a crew may get sick, um, they have another crew on backup. Um, and then also just to focus on their trash pickup um, and not so much on their recycling. Okay, all right. That's good to know. And then um, what is the most important thing that you know you guys would like to share with our attendees going forward as we uh, work through this crazy pandemic? Um, what is the most important thing that you uh, would like um, our communities and our attendees at this um, webinar to take away from your perspective? I can start just real quick. Um, I'd say from our perspective, of course, we're talking about how important it is to continue recycling programs, but we know that the health and safety of the employees who are doing that work is first and foremost. So, you know, we understand if there are situations that arise um, that necessitate, you know, changes or temporary suspensions to the program, we've been in constant communication with our regulatory colleagues and they are, you know, open to being reactive to the situation. So, I would say um, keep your people safe and communicate with us if you need to make changes. Great. Thank you. And Alex, what say you? <laughs> Um, I'll just piggyback on that because that is what I would um, offer to our uh, governments as well. But also just if you do have changes, um, don't be afraid to tell me, please, because I would rather know. Um, just keep the communication open. Um, and also, if you have changes and are sharing it with your residents, just make sure they know it's temporary and that this is all because of what is going on. Um, we have gotten some questions, you know, from residents, what's happening? Um, are they recycling this? Is it going to the landfill? And it's just important to make sure the communication is open as much as possible while still trying to have an effective program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thank you guys so much. We, um, we do need to um, move on, but if there are questions that have left unanswered, have been left unanswered from the panelists, we can certainly try to touch on those at the end. Um, and also, you have, um, you know, complete access to Sandy and um, and Alex. Uh, they are working, um, so <laughs> so you can reach out to them individually too, and we will share contact information um, um, uh, after this. Webinar. So, um, Marissa, we uh, we do not have a poll next, correct? We can go into the collection safety panel. I just want to make sure we didn't miss a poll. No, you're good to go. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so you know, let's get into uh, let's get into it here. Okay, uh, let's get into the safety um, aspects in light of COVID for, for solid waste collections. And again, we're focusing on um, recycling waste diversion, but we can um, relate this to any um, aspect of, of collection. Um, and so I'll remind you, you know, to put your questions in the Q&A box as well as we go through this and we will try to get to those. So on this panel, uh, we have Bob Holden Solid Waste Manager with the Town of Cary. We have Alex Miller, again, with South Carolina DHEC. We have Tracy Nestor joining us from Republic Services. Um, and we have Dr. Laura Merrill um, with James Madison University. And so starting with Bob, 
um, we're going to each of you go through and talk to us a little bit uh, before we go into Q&A. So starting with Bob, um, I'd like you to talk about who you are, um, what you do normally, under normal circumstances, what you do day to day, uh, what, is, what is your uh, job like, and why you're joining us today, and how this pandemic has affected your operation, and anything else you'd like to share with us, of course. Um, but Bob, uh, you're up first, and, and tell us what's going on. Okay, thank you, Mary. Uh, well, I am the solid waste manager, as you can see, and it's day-to-day -day operations. We do collections of approximately 55,000 households. Uh, Cary has its own staff that does the collections, and we also have our own fleet and our set of uh, fleet mechanics, which keep us rolling. Uh, we're really fortunate we do all kinds we have full service we also have uh, a convenient center for our citizens to use as well which helped us with some of the decisions we made because of the pandemic uh, carrie was uh, when the pandemic started we opened the uh, carrie opened the eoc emergency operations center which was a smart move on their part we it helped everybody uh, work together know what each division uh, departments are doing together, working together. Uh, we run social media through the EOC to make sure that the messaging is clear and concise. We have uh, awesome citizens. This, this, so this was uh, crazy for us that how many people have loved to see the garbage trucks coming down the road or the yard waste truck or the recycling truck and, and um, our staff has really felt the love of our fantastic citizens. Our leadership at the town, the um, management level, has kept us all abreast of what's going on throughout this whole pandemic. And it all began like, in, so we've been doing this for over a month now. March 17th was the first day that we really reduced forces. So it was only essential staff being reporting to work and essential staff being solid waste, yard waste, recycling. We also have um, you know, some park attendants and because parks never closed. <clears throat> we also had some people from operations just in case there were sewer spills and stuff. We wanted to keep people on site. Um, let's see. Then we also have, if we had some duplicates in positions that weren't necessarily uh, like supervisors, so we rotate supervisors. We don't have all the supervisors coming in every every week. We have them uh, rotate and kind of helps keep social distancing and less people coming in, right? Um, about April time frame, so two weeks in, the town, uh, Kerry made the decision to put one person per vehicle to help with social distancing. We really focused on the health and safety of our employees and our coworkers. That created some challenges because we had to get vehicles for all these collectors that normally rode in the truck with, our, uh, with their crew. We overcame that. Fortunately, Kerry also has a pool vehicle system. Uh, we asked our customers that normally have backdoor service, which are like townhome communities, we asked them to bring their carts to the curb and our citizens responded fantastically. They, they brought them no, no issues there. We um, had challenges of trying to find hand sanitizer for everybody. So we were using hand sanitizers, gloves, masks. We've been fortunate that people are donating masks. It's the, the um, support we've received from everybody has been fantastic. We also had to get radios for all these guys who are driving individual vehicles to and from the routes. We had to get them um, handheld radios so they could be in contact with their crew. We also are taking people's temperatures every morning when they come to work to make sure that uh, we're keeping all of us safe. We also were <laughs> able to get help. So normally we have uh, crews of three, uh, three collectors and a driver. And now we can only put two people on the riding steps, one on each side. And it was uh, very challenging for some of the yard waste crews, and especially 
and we reached out to other divisions of public works, uh, facilities, and operations, and our coworkers just stepped up. We had plenty of volunteers that have helped, that have been doing, uh, guys that normally uh, working in, in on a, me- a, me- a mechanic are now picking up yard waste with us. It's just fantastic. We have been doing special cleaning for our vehicles and offices. We also stopped uh, special collections, curbside collections like bulky items, extra cardboard, things of that nature. But because we also have a uh, citizens convenience center, it, it, it gave our citizens an option to bring those materials and take care of them themselves and we didn't have to. So it really hasn't really impacted them too much. We did see huge increases in our yard waste, and I think that's just because people are home and the weather's been, been real pretty. So that's a good thing, and I'm glad we – that was one of the things we thought, well, we may want to reduce yard waste so that we don't have so many people coming in, but um, it's a well-loved program. But, uh, that's about where I'm at right now. That's awesome, Bob. Thank you so much. It sounds like you guys are doing a ton, and I know we're going to have uh, some questions for you at, uh, later on for okay. sure. Um, but I really, we appreciate that um, local government perspective. And um, in contrast, uh, we have Tracy Nestor with us, who you know may provide a sort of a different perspective from um, the corporate environment with uh, Republic Services. Tracy, I wonder if you can um, let us know, you know, who you are, what you do for Republic, and um, tell us what is, um, sorry, I'm going out of order, guys. Tell us what's going um, on with Republic right now, please. Sure. Thanks, Mary. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that um, I want to say thank you for including the private sector um, uh, in this um, dialogue. And my role with Republic is I'm the senior area manager for municipal sales. Uh, Republic Services supports about 250 local government contracts between Baltimore and Savannah, and I oversee those contracts. Those are contracts for um, residential collection as well as convenience site um, collection and management, commercial collection, and um, industrial roll-off collection. So, um, you know, uh, to maybe add a little more context or color to, to what Bob had to say is, is just to say that, you know, our world changed around March the 15th. And it's going to change forever. Um, I, I can't see us really going back and um, modifying any of these um, uh, safety um, implementations that, that, that we have implemented. Um, I think that, that that will be a, a norm moving forward. Um, you know, our, our first thing responses were that we did from a residential perspective suspend yard waste and bulk so that we could focus on uh, MSW and recycling collection. We have not had any of our customers in the Mid-Atlantic um, suspend recycling, so we're, we're very grateful for that. Um, but, but, but maybe I can speak to one of the reasons we've been able to do that is because all of our recycling is automated and, and cart contents only. So um, uh, we can do that um, by servicing carts. Um, we, so we suspended those services and then we started implementing our, our safety protocol, which would be that um, we're disinfecting trucks every night and we are, um, uh, the drivers now are wearing masks and gloves. Um, there are safety meetings are um, held with social distancing in mind and we're having to stagger them. Um, we would have safety meetings, you know, every morning before the drivers would go out on the routes. And now we're having to stagger when those drivers are coming in to make sure that there's enough room in the area or conduct them outside where everybody can be six feet apart. Um, uh, our struggles when we were um, uh, implementing these new uh, safety protocols were we could not, um, there was a shortage of masks. Um, and there was a shortage of hand sanitizer. Um, I wanna mention that one of the things that we started doing, even though we're a nationally you know, branded company and we procure nationally, we started um, consulting with um, lo- trying to get local vendors to, to fill those gaps. And I want to um, 
I don't know the name of it and I wish I could recognize it, but they're particular in Raleigh, we were able to uh, reach out to some uh, distilleries that um, were able to get a permit to manufacture um, a hand sanitizer. And in our Raleigh market, we just received a 50 gallon um, uh, uh, drum worth of hand sanitizer. So we should have enough hand sanitizer moving um, forward. Um, by contacting these local distilleries and um, and utilizing them. Republic is also, um, from a driver perspective, um, we also have to consider retaining our drivers, right? Because drivers are a high commodity right now and, um, and we wanna retain them. And with the volume moving from the, you know, from the businesses more to the curb, there's some drivers that have had reduced hours and um, Republic is, is implementing programs to make sure that we re retain our employees through this. And one of that is that one of those um, programs uh, is that we send food home uh, with our drivers. Um, we buy them a meal at work every week and then we send a meal home to their family every week. Um, one of the other things that we're doing is that we have been purchasing local um, gift cards and the amount of $100 to give to our drivers every other week so that they're spending money with our customers and trying to keep that small business afloat. Um, uh, and, and like I said, and these things are going to continue, um, especially the safety, the social distancing, um, the, the sanitizing of the trucks every day, the, the emphasis for PPE and hand, san hand sanitizer will be a permanent part of Republic moving forward. Thank you so much for that, Tracy. That That is a, a great perspective. And I know there's gonna be questions for you too, but let's um, move on. Alex, I know you touched on this a little bit, so you, know, you don't have to talk for long about this, but just briefly tell us um, a little bit about what you know about drop-off sites and what kind of safety measures um, there they're seeming to take um, in your in your conversations you've had so far? Yeah, so from what I've heard um, at the drop-off sites, um, programs are giving a lot of attention to the proper PPE, so masks, um, hand sanitizer, um, instruct making sure that the attendants know to frequently hand wash. Um, a common practice right now is asking the residents to not bring items that they can't lift themselves so the attendants don't have to go and help the residents and um, be in direct contact or touch the materials that they're bringing in so that we can protect our attendants. Um, also, I know in Pickens County, at least, they're asking their um, older attendants, 70 and older, um, to stay home out of their own safety and health. Um, so that is a concern as well. Um, I know one drop off in Anderson County, they had to close theirs because their attendant is not is a, a man um, of older age and of underlying health conditions. So what I'm seeing is our programs really are focusing on the health and safety of the attendants and making sure that they know all the, the proper protocol and all the CDC guidelines and really pushing that. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, now, uh, next I would like to um, hear from Dr. Laura Merrill. Uh, Dr. Merrill, thanks for joining us today and um, tell us uh, a little bit about uh, your experience. Um, you have such a different experience than probably the rest of us, I'm guessing. Um, and I uh, would, would love to hear your perspective and how you, how you got roped into this. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Mary. Um, yes, I um, do have a much different perspective. So um, I am an assistant professor at the, at the James Madison University, and I teach in the Department of Health Sciences. And um, currently, I teach senior students the class of epidemiology, which probably none of you had heard of that <laughs> prior to this experience. Um, and so in, in late January and early February, I was teaching my students about um, disease outbreak investigation and epidemics and pandemics. And, and unfortunately, we're in a situation where we're all having to learn about that now. 
In addition to that, I also teach um, health communication. So how do we communicate um, to the public, you know, on a public health level about um, issues of health and what are the best practices there? Um, and uh, of course, I also do um, scientific research. And so how I got roped into this, well, uh, Mary and I are college uh, best friends. And I was thinking about it before this um, webcast started and we've known each other for 20 years now. So, um, so she reached out to me because she was um, really looking for somebody who could maybe answer some of those questions about the health side of things. And so what I would like my role to be is to, you've probably been hearing a lot of information through um, you know, your state health departments, through popular media, and I've really tried to uh, go and look at um, you know, the science and the data that those recommendations are, are based on. So when it comes to um, you know, social distancing and hand washing and PPE, um, looking at the data, looking at you know, how long the virus will survive on different sur surface types, and trying to contextualize that science um, for you and your employees and the and the public at large. So, you know, I, I'm really gratified to hear that you are all already talking about you know health and safety procedures and risk mitigation efforts that you know I would have told you to start with, but you're already thinking about those things. So I'll kind of end there um, unless there are specific questions that people have. Thank you so much, Laura. I mean, um, Dr. Merrill. <laughs> um, I don't know what I'm supposed to call you um, since we've known each other so long. But um, thank you so much for that. And we appreciate the time and the research you're helping us with um, on this. It, there's really a decided lack of kind of resources in our um, in our industry that can relate these things. So I told uh, Laura before we did this, I said, your number one concern about participating in this is that you'll probably get invited to a bunch more webinars. <laughs> so apologize in advance for that. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I want to talk about is, you know, there's a ton of information out there that we're trying to synthesize and and some of it is conflicting um, about the spread and, and the best safety measures for Corona. Um, and, you know, at first the, the prevailing recommendations really changed a lot um, from day to day. They changed more than a baby's diaper, honestly. Um, but, you know, now things seem to be settling down a bit and, um, you know, I'm wondering for our um, commute, for our panelists, for Bob and for Tracy and for Alex, where are you all uh, getting your um, information from, and how are you uh, processing that with with so much out there to to uh, digest? And I'll start with you, Bob. No, oh, thank you. We're really fortunate. Again, like I said, the town opened up its own EOC. And we have specialists that in the logistics group that help us and make a lot of those decisions on what's the best safety practices and trying to keep everybody safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so you kind of have staff people that are um, devoted to that and, and they're getting their information from um, hopefully uh, reliable sources. Um, Tracy, uh, tell us about you guys and where you um, you feel like you're getting your your information from as far as what are the best um, what are the risks and what are the best uh, ways to protect ourselves. Our company uh, has uh, started mandating a daily call that we have. So we have an area call every morning um, that runs from about 8:30 to 10 a.m. And that is to receive um, actually updates from each one of our BUs on any, if they have any um, positive tests um, and what they're seeing in the, in, you know, in their market. Uh, above that, our corporate um, headquarters in Phoenix is uh, very well connected with, um, uh, I, I guess, at the right levels with CDC, I don't, and um, some universities where they're receiving the information. 
and and then they're pushing that out to us. So um, um, gotcha. I would just say that we're just getting it from our headquarters. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. And um, Dr. Merrill, tell us, you know, in your in your view, what is the best or most reliable place, you know, for for us to get information, you know, if we don't have um, some of these experts um, on our staffs, uh, or like in the case of, um, you know, the local governments that Alex is talking about with their drop off sites, you know, that may be operating um, autonomously and may want to know where they can get the best information about how to protect ourselves from from COVID-19 in our in our jobs. So the best place and most reliable place to get um, information would be the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and from there, the state um, health departments. And state health departments are talking regularly and consistently um, with the CDC about, you know, what the, the proper um, sort of the risk mitigation efforts should be. Uh, thankfully, the best things that we can do right now are the things that you've been hearing about, and thankfully they're not unique, um, and that those are social distancing as best you can. And of course, there are limitations given how your collections or how your, um, you know, how your operations work, but certainly you and your employees will have the best ideas about how to do that and um, how to sort of continue your functions in your communities. Um, hygiene practices, including hand washing often. Now, of course, I know that, you know, if you have um, attendants or employees on a truck, that makes it difficult because you need soap and water. Um, you can use hand sanitizer, but I think as uh, Tracy pointed out, um, it may be difficult to come by. Um, and using um, disinfectant, um, if you can't get wipes, then um, you can make um, effective at home uh, disinfectant. And then utilizing risk mitigation efforts in terms of the personal protective equipment, um, which types of equipment um, are better than others if you don't have access um, to sort of like N95 masks? Um, should you be wearing gloves? Should you be wearing glasses? What do you do with your, your clothing that you've worked all day, um, you know, on a truck or, or, or out in the public? Um, so I think the best, um, the best resources are definitely the CDC and using, you know, common sense when it comes to what we know about how viruses and germs can pass from person to person. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much. Now, um, let's, uh, we only have a few minutes left on this panel. So one thing that we I really want y'all to talk about is the communication um, between um, inner office uh, communication with employees, um, and then uh, follow that up with communication to the public about what, what you're doing. But, but first, let's talk about in inter-office communication as far as um, uh, PPE, COVID, and um, what is, what's working, what's not working, what are you doing to uh, create an open communication environment? And I will start with uh, Tracy. As I mentioned, we're having daily calls so that there's no surprises. Uh, from an employee perspective, if um, an, an employee, um, we've encouraged them to be very um, open and honest and be able to discuss if they don't feel well. Um, you know, uh, we don't want people coming to work that, that don't feel well. So um, one of the other things that we've offered is if there are any um, medical uh we've offered them and if they are diagnosed with COVID, they get an additional 10 days of, um, of uh, uh, vacation. And then we're, we're also paying for any healthcare related costs that they may have for oh, COVID. Wow. So, that's um, so that's the communication that we've gotten out to our employees. If they come to us with a presumed pro positive, they're automatically quarantined for 14 days. Um, until they get a doctor's note that says that they could come back. So, so we tell them to go home for 14 days and prove to us that, um, that you're not sick if you want to come back before then. 
and we've mm -hmm. had quite a few of those. Um, wow. We have had, um, I think we have three positive cases in the mid-Atlantic area, none mm -hmm. that I'm aware of in North Carolina or South Carolina within our, um, within our group. Um, but the two that we've had were in, Char one was, two were in Charlottesville, Virginia, and then we've had another one in our um, Frederick, Maryland office. So we've had, we've had um, three. Um, and basically, um, we've not had any um, bad news for many of those. And we even have one that had tested positive and has been through the 14-day quarantine and has really has um, had the doctor's release and is coming back to work. So um, just to kind of maybe sum that up to your, to your question is being, just being very transparent and trying to take any pressure over them not being able to or being concerned about letting us know whether they feel good and whether they're sick and, and trying to overcome any financial burden that, that this um, event has put on them. That is phenomenal. That is wonderful to hear. And, and Bob, tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing in terms of um, communication with employees and, and, and what do you do if, if someone's feeling sick? How are you addressing that? Uh, very similar to what Tracy was saying. When uh, people call in sick, they don't feel well, we ask them to go to the doctors and they actually they have to go to the doctors or the virtual doctor and get cleared because we don't want others to get sick mm -hmm. and we're trying to protect everybody. Um, as far as communications, we, we get daily communications uh, through the EOC and um, the town manager because it's, uh, we're in this together and it's been a very strong community approach to making sure that each member of uh, our staff has access to information. We, uh, HR, our human resources department has opened up phone lines. So not everybody has a smartphone or computer and they opened up a phone line so that uh, people that don't have that access can call in and find out what's going on, what they need to do, uh, what's the status with the town and, and different jobs. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just been uh, pre pretty amazing that uh, uh, the supervisors, you know, we, we talk to employees every day for the, uh, for the solid waste staff that come in every day. I mean, we're, we're always sharing new information with them, posting any different um, updates that they, they need to be aware of and um, monitoring people's morale. And it's been uh, phenomenal, people's morale around here. I've, I've never experienced uh, the camaraderie and um, caring for each other. So that, that's the other thing, people look out for each other and, and they make sure that they keep their social distancing and make okay. sure that they're wearing the mask and they're washing their hands and all that. So it's, it's self-monitoring plus each mm -hmm. other, looking out for each other. Sounds very supportive. Now, um, Laura, hearing this, you know, what is, uh, what is your sense? Is, is this uh, what we're talking about in these two examples? Is this going to improve health outcomes significantly? And, and is there anything else you would advise in terms of inter-office uh, or inter-employee communication? I think y'all are doing great. Y'all are doing the things that you really should be doing um, from what I know from a health communication standpoint. Um, when we have open, um, honest, clear communication um, at the different levels, you know, that makes sure it, 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 it assures that everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. Um, if you're communicating with employees and, and letting them know what you know, um, as soon as you do, you know, you have um, a reciprocal relationship where they're going to do the same for you, hopefully. Also, you know, talking to employees and, and telling them, hey, wanting to know if you're sick or if, you know, something changes with your family is never meant to be punitive. It's only so that we can keep you healthy and safe and that we can keep your coworkers healthy and safe. Um, I know that a lot of people now are sort of worried about job security and and they might be worried that, well, you know, I, I do have a little bit of a cough, but, you know, what if it's only allergies? And so they, they may be hesitant or reticent to talk openly with 
um, their em employers. But if their employers are doing the things that y'all are doing, I think that you're really creating this um, environment of having open, honest, um, clear communication so that everybody knows what we're doing, why we're doing it, and that it's all so that we can keep, you know, our people who are our greatest resource, keep them safe and healthy. Now, Laura, uh, we talked about this a little bit, be you know, uh, last week or the week before about um, w communicating with employees about what, at what to do at home to stay safe and to prevent spreading, um, you know, germs from work to home and from home to work. So can you talk about that just uh, briefly? I, we're running over a bit on this panel, but I, I do want you to touch on, on home um, communication and how important that is. Yeah, so it, it's very important that the uh, employees know that they also need to be aware of what's going on in their family unit. So if, if their spouses or their children are, are you know, exiting the house daily and coming into contact with other people, that that's potentially... Um, putting them at risk and, and anybody that they come in contact with. Um, if I think, you know, we talked a lot about sort of what do you do? Like, yes, you're, you're doing your social distancing at home or excuse me, at work and you're washing your hands at, at work and maybe using hand sanitizer. Well, what do you do when you get home? And I think um, they need to be taking off their shoes outside at the door in the garage um, and, you know, taking off their work clothes and, and those should be going straight into the wash um, that they should, they shouldn't be wearing the same set of work clothes without washing every single day. And um, that they then, once they get home, they go straight to a shower and, and take a shower. And um, that's the best way to make sure that, you know, they're keeping their home safe and, and, um, and that their work clothes, like when they get ready to come into work, that those are sort of the last thing they put on before heading out the house. And of course, putting on the shoes, um, you know, maybe out, mm -hmm. uh, outside of the house. So those are just, and those are easy to do, I think, for, for most families, that, that that doesn't take a lot of time, effort, or money to be able to do. So I think that that's what you were referring to. Yes, exactly. Thank you so much for touching on that. So um, as you guys can see, we have a poll going um, because we're running over, we went ahead and, and showed you the poll. Um, and you can see kind of what some of the safety concerns that folks that are on the call have, which I, I think we're at um, almost 100 participants on the call now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, you know, this is uh, coming in, we're concerned about um, going back to work too soon before this is over. We're concerned about um, just keeping people as safe as possible. So, so we'll try to touch on um, some of these um, concerns at the end if we have time, but we now need to um, move on to our, um, our MRF panel. So I wanna thank you panelists and you're not off the hook yet, but you can go ahead and, and uh, mute, except for you, Laura. Um, <laughs> we're gonna work you pretty hard on this one, I think. Um, but uh, I want us to um, go ahead and move on to our, our MRF safety panel. So, you know, um, we, we wanted to include MRF safety because, um, you know, it's extremely important that, you know, we not only have safety at the curb, but that we know um, that where our materials are going, that we're not participating in um, making someone else less safe. So even though, you know, maybe uh, most of the people on the call may not be in the MRF environment, um, it's really important that we understand what they are going through because that is going to affect collections. And so, um, so that's why we really needed to include this um, panel in, in particular. So, um, so I will start with with Joe. Um, Joe is the engineering and compliance manager for Mecklenburg County, and they have a, a very large um, countywide uh, material recovery facility there in um, in Charlotte. Joe, if you would introduce yourself and uh, tell this how, tell us how this has affected um, your operations. I'm sorry, I did out of order again, but go ahead, Joe. Joe, do we have you? Okay. Um, well, sorry about that. I had to mm -hmm. um, grab my mouse and unmute me. <laughs> but um, my name is Joe Hack, 
I work with Mecklenburg County. We're a metropolitan area of roughly a million people. The largest city has more than 200,000 houses and we serve roughly 450,000 residential dwelling units. And among the other options is um, we operate a material recovery facility. And the, um, the, the safety of the employees is very important to us. And one of the big things is we're communicating a recycle right message, is, you know, put the right things into the right containers. Because one of the things we'll be talking about is we are seeing an excess in contamination. Um, our MRF that normally receives about 300 tons to 350 tons a day is averaging almost 400 tons a day. And you know, even this morning, we had more than 1,000 tons on the floor. So um, our concern as a MRF operator is, um, you know, like I said, the safety. What we've done in the MRF is um, the employee break room, we have expanded into the educational area. We have stopped educational presentation and now and allow the employees to um, use the education area for breaks. The other one of the other items is the plant manager is sending us daily health updates. We cannot run the plant without people. So we're um, monitoring the health of the people in the plant. And, you know, so we're communicating actively with them. We have also um, pushing out public service messages to the community to remind them to recycle right and to put the right things in the right container. You know, for example, messages like, if your house is impacted, um, bag your recyclables and put it out with the trash. So we are um, continuing to monitor that. The other thing is a planning entity is, um, we're also trying to evaluate what happens if the MRF, um, something happens to the MRF, we can't process materials. So on that side, we're um, looking at downstream markets, we're looking at market conditions, we're actually having discussions with DEQ about what happens if we have to landfill our materials if we have no place to process them. Um, the other issue that you'll hear about is contamination. Um, one of our challenges is we have four full service drop centers as well. We have seen more than a doubling of customer counts coming into our um, drop centers. Um, the sheer volume is impacting the safety as we go. So it is a, a very large operational challenge. We lost two hours of processing the other day because of a brake pad that someone thought was recyclables um, jammed the glass screen. So it is a, um, an ongoing challenge. And you know, once you get it out of the trucks, it comes to the facility and um, how quickly can we process it? Much like the others, we have hand sanitizer, um, the operational practices in the MRF for health and safety aren't similar. They've always been. Um, respiratory protection is available. Gloves and social distancing are um, the big ones on that one. Um, biggest thing that's hurting us right now is wishful recycling. Is people putting the wrong things um, into the container, the overflow of trash, uh, the trash coming in. Residue, haven't seen the numbers, but I would not be surprised to see it drifting um, a good bit above 20% um, for this month. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Joe. And um, Patrick, let's hear from uh, you from the Sunoco perspective. So Patrick McDonald is uh, the Raleigh plant manager for Sunoco Recycling, uh, big company, lots of impact, lots of customers in, in the Carolinas, uh, North and South. So Patrick, give us, um, tell us a little bit about what's going on with you and with Sunoco right now. Yes, thank you, Mary, and thank you, uh, by all means, for including MRFs in this discussion as well. So uh, just a real quick background on our MRF in Raleigh. Uh, we're processing between nine and 10,000 tons per month of residential commingled. Uh, we've got about 90 people working at, at our Raleigh MRF across two different ships, so it's a significant operation for us. Um, and we felt this would be a good opportunity today just to share best practices in terms of how we're dealing with these challenges uh, along with our peer group, really as a way to continue to ensure the viability of, of these operations during this time, because it's, it's basically that's what it's coming down to, is, is ensuring that all of our workers remain uh, vigilant against, uh, against the risk. So in terms of some of the specifics around what we've done, similar to what others have mentioned and, and what Joe spoke about in Mecklenburg, um, you know, the same social distancing, um, increased uh, hand washing and sanitizers, uh, where that ha can get a little uh, difficult is there are a couple of, of sort positions in our MRF. Uh, 
uh, just owing to the configuration, the layout of the process flow and conveyor belts that we've had to modify a couple of positions where we could not provide that six foot buffer. Um, so we, we have made a couple operational modifications, nothing major. Um, similar to what Mecklenburg is doing, we're uh, obviously no longer doing tours at this point, so we've got a, a nice big education center on our second floor, so we've converted that to an overflow break room and lunch area so we can uh, continue to provide more distance for our employees. And on that, we've got very strict protocols around PPE. So uh, PPE cannot come into the uh, office, the break room, the lunch area, the restrooms. It's, it's got to remain out in the plant. And we've also um, enacted sanitation stations for our PPE, mostly uh, the biggest impact there is gloves. So we're you know, a MRF sorter has an array of gloves that they, they wear on a normal basis. They've got kind of an interior glove, then they have an external glove that provides protection against sharps, uh, needles, and the like. So we, uh, we're increasing the sanitation of those gloves. Um, and as I said, just beyond that, we're, we've got a person who's dedicated going around wiping down common touch points, door handles, uh, light switches, things like that. Um, but I did want to mention it's, it's not directly related to COVID, but I think, you know, we would all acknowledge our, our industry, whether it's on the collection side or the processing side at a MRF, can be an inherently dangerous uh, undertaking, right? There's a lot of risk. So we, we've been very careful and, and adamant to stress to our folks that all of the, the safety risks that existed in January prior to COVID, be it things like lockout, tagout, and energy isolation or pedestrian safety, all of those risks are still out there. Um, they may get kind of lost in the, in the noise with all of the um, uh, action around COVID, which is appropriate, but we've, we've been uh, very adamant to stress that those other risks remain out there as well. So we have to keep our, our, uh, our, our mind on task with mitigating and managing through those risks the way we normally would. Yes, anyone who's worked in, in a MRF environment knows that uh, MRFs and MRF workers are no stranger to strangers to to dangers. Um, <laughs> it's so unpredictable of, of what comes in, but uh, but this is something like you know we've we've never seen before. Um, so a couple questions um, specifically about your um, contamination that you're seeing. What is um, is there a trend on the contamination that you uh, both are seeing in um, coming into the into the MRFs? Um, is it bagged recycling, or is it just the bad recyclers just doing more bad recycling? What what do you think it is? And I think this whole question will help us figure out how to address you know, education needs in our community. So um, go ahead, uh, Patrick. At this point, we haven't, you know, there's a, a, a seasonal variation in, in some of the contamination numbers anyway, because people's practices are, are different in say April than what they would be in, in February or, or September. So uh, we're, we're trying not to read too much into the numbers. Once we have full month numbers, it will be a little bit easier to, to crunch that data, to look for trends. Um, just anecdotally out on the lines and just looking at some of the, the volume of our outbound residue, uh, I haven't seen anything too perceptible at this point, uh, but we're certainly uh, keeping an eye out for all sorts of trends just because there's been such a, a big shift in, in patterns and in, in, uh, consumer patterns and household patterns, it's daily life. So, um, you, you know, one thought is Initially, our, our suspicion was that we would see a spike in our commingled material this across all grades, but um, we haven't quite seen that yet. And uh, if you consider the fact that many of our municipal and county suppliers are on a, a two-week collection cycle, it very well may be the case that we just don't, we're not getting all of the recycling that we used to because people are filling the bins up faster. Uh, and if they're doing that, maybe that recycling is making its way into the MSW bin, or maybe it's uh, being put in their, you know, pickup truck and brought to the county convenience center. Um, so long-winded answer, we, I don't really have any clear data on the contamination rates at this point, um, mm -hmm. above and beyond. You, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a rosy picture in, in the best of times when we're, you know, in the high teens, sometimes as much as 20%. Um, so it, it's, my, it's my sincere hope that that represents the, the ceiling of contamination percentage, but um, as of yet, I, I have not seen any clear data on that. Okay, thank you. And Joe, what about you? Tell us uh, if you, if you have any more insights on this. Well, um, there's 
it's really a whole series of things and, and running through there, um, all of the goodwills near our um, drop centers have closed. So things that people wanted to um, give away at Goodwill are showing up in our recycling bins. So you have a lot of the cloth mm. fiber products. Other impact we're having is we've seen an increase of yard waste coming in. We had two municipalities, um, Charlotte and Matthews that um, made decisions to postpone um, yard waste collection and people still wanted to recycle it. In fact, I mentioned earlier, we approached the state about um, relaxation on the commingled um, bottles and cans going to the landfill. We're also talking with the state about um, possibly getting some yard waste into the landfill. Um, some other things we're seeing, as you mentioned, um, the plastic bags. Um, people bag their plastic bags. It wraps around all the rotating shaft equipment. We, um, we do not open bags. We just throw them away for employee safety reasons. The other thing that's really impacting us um, is scrap steel items, um, brake pads, car parts, you know, things that if you go to our website, it says we take scrap metal, but only at our drop centers. These are things that rip the conveyor belts apart. They block the screens. So it's really a, a whole series of contaminants that um, are increasing as we um, if people are staying at home. And it's just, you know, you know, I would say right now the biggest thing are the um, goodwill items, the plastic bags, and the yard waste. Um, and every once in a while, the, the metal item that tears a conveyor belt apart. Very interesting. Um... Very interesting. Um, so at, at this point, um, you know, we're, we have about 20 more minutes. So I want to just kind of open it up to um, all of the panelists now. And I don't think we have a slide with every panelist on it. Um, <laughs> we probably should have. But um, I want to open up to, to everyone um, for the, for the Q&A coming in for the audiences in, in the last um, little bit of this. And so um, so I do have um, a health question for, for Laura um, regarding the risk of um, contracting, you know, COVID from a surface. So I think this is a big question that is sort of seems unresolved um, as far as, you know, when we're handling items from a household, whether it's at the MRF or at the curb, you know, we're, we're primarily worrying about um, the spread of the virus in our respiratory system. Um, but what I think, so tell me what, is, am I thinking right? Should we be, um, how worried should we be about surfaces and, and keeping in mind the types of surfaces that we would come in contact with, you know, plastic that has been, has come in contact with saliva, um, or God knows what else, but hopefully just saliva and, <laughs> you know, other, other exposure that we have. What is your sense of, of our biggest, um, risks there, or, or maybe it's not as risky as, as we think with surfaces. So the biggest risk for COVID um, transmission is actually person to person. So um, being around somebody, sort of being within that six foot social distance uh, and talking and, you know, somebody either being um, asymptomatic or low symptomatic such that they don't even recognize that they have symptoms um, and having viral particles being aerosolized in our spit. So that's, that's where most people are, you know, coming into contact with the virus. Is it possible that virus can be transmitted to surfaces and then transmitted to another person that way? Yes, it is. Um, it is, however, low risk. I, I don't wanna say it's no risk. Um, there's been several studies that have come out in the last two weeks or so, preliminary studies, about how long virus can live on certain uh, surfaces. And I'm sure a lot of you have, have heard about you know, cardboard, it'll, it can live for 24 hours, um, plastics for two to three days, metal for two to three days, and, and glass for four days. I want to contextualize that study and that they're looking at how long virus particles possibly can live on those surfaces. And most virus will die um, between anywhere from between 10 minutes and two hours. That's where the biggest risk is. Um, so, you know, very little virus is going to remain on surfaces um, beyond that time. 
That's not to say that no virus can live on those surfaces. Um, surfaces that um, are flat and are harder will hold the virus longer than sort of rougher um, sort of other surfaces. So that's why um, glass and plastic, you know, we see the, the maximum time that the virus can live on those surface be much longer um, than, um, you know, other, other sort of sorts of materials. So that's where sort of the research is right now. Um, but you've probably heard all that and I just kind of want to contextualize that they're talking about the absolute maximums and not the, you know, the average time that, that large amounts of virus will remain active on, on any surface. So, you know, the biggest risk is just being around people. That's why I'm like, yes, y'all are doing the right thing by, by social distancing. Um, but that's not to say that there's no risk when it comes to the surfaces that, that your people are coming into contact. You know, I'm actually more concerned um, with the public who are coming in um, to contact with employees, maybe dropping off materials um, at the different processing sites, you know, whether or not, you know, they're coming in masked up and having already pre-sorted their materials so they're not, they're spending only the time that they need to in, um, you know, in the recycling center or at the drop site. Um, where I live in Harrisonburg, um, they're only allowing, there's no recycling pickup from curbside. You have to take your recycles, recyclables either to the processing plant or to a drop site. And so I went to take my recyclables last Saturday and there weren't any signs about people, you know, maintaining social distancing and, and you know, I was trying to dodge people right and left who were trying to come up next to me and recycle their own, own material. So um, that's where I would see the greatest sort of risk for your employees. And I'm happy to answer any other follow-up questions about that. Awesome. I, I think that what you what you just said is um, extremely comforting. I hope everybody uh, feels that way too. But um, we do have um, questions about about drop site safety, drop site safety in particular. And so, you know, since we're open to the whole panel and we have um, a good amount of, of people that do both collection and drop off sites, um, tell. Um, those of you who are operating drop sites or have knowledge of them, um, tell us, you know, how uh, you're mitigating that specific risk now that we know it's more likely to spread from person to person um, through, through uh, droplets. Um, and Laura, I'll ask you next to talk a little bit about droplets versus airborne and just so we have a little bit of information on that. But, but um, first, let me um, kick that to Alex Miller um, regarding drop sites. So I know you touched on this a bit, but how are we making, how are the drop sites you know of keeping um, that a really good level of social distance when also trying to monitor what's being dropped off? Yeah, so we have a few examples. Um, such as Anderson County, who has um, temporarily suspended some of the materials that are frequently sorted by the attendants um, for their health and safety. Um, also, just making sure that um, the attendants know ab about all the proper protocol. I know um, Greenville County, they have, um, they've gone over kind of like a not a contract per se, but just signed a form saying that they know about the proper protocol. Um, they will do their best to abide by it all. Um, so really making sure that it's in their heads and that they're they're taking this seriously um, for their own safety and their family's safety, um, but also for the residents' safety. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Um, but I, I guess just making sure that the attendants know the seriousness of the situation and, you know, mm -hmm. are doing the best that they can. Yeah. Okay, great. Does any, uh, any other panelists uh, want to weigh in on this? I'll, I'll wait just a couple seconds if anyone else wants to pipe in on that. Well, this is Joe. I can weigh in on it. Okay. Um, the drop centers have been a challenge with us being essential business and everybody staying at home everybody's coming to visit us right now. 
Uh, we've had sites that were, you know, doing a couple hundred tickets a day that are now processing a thousand or more customers a day. And some things that we've put in place is um, on the fee collection side, we stopped taking cash, we closed the windows, we put in microphone systems, we're only taking credit cards. So we're tr trying to isolate the fee collectors from um, contact with customers. On the staff, we're having to hire security guards and um, bring additional staff in just to direct traffic. Because as you uh, imagine, when people wait in line, um, tempers get a little hot. Um, some of the other challenges is, and while we have staff on the ground, is maintaining social distancing, is we're having people who have never visited our sites before who don't know where to go when they get there. And so it's been a constant re-education of trying to, um, to keep the sites open, especially um, when we're supposed to be staying at home and no one at the drop centers appears to be. Okay, thanks for weighing in on that. Does anybody else have a comment? Hey, Mary, this is Alex. I, I Can I just add on to that? Sure. Um, yeah, so we are also seeing that. Um, obviously, some programs, I, will, I don't want to say have better customers, but more understanding customers than others. Um, and for example, in Greenville County, they have also added some more employee, uh, temporary employees to kind of direct traffic. They've added signage. Uh, but not all programs can do that. So it really is just a, an education for kind of new customers for them as well. Yes, and Bob, um, I know you wanted to weigh in as well. Go ahead, Bob. I sure did. Thank you. And Carrie, we, we uh, posted signs, a special social distancing sign. And we also did social media guidelines for using the convenience center such as maintaining your six feet of distance, uh, being responsible for unloading your own vehicle. And we also, uh, we charged fees for certain items that came in and we eliminated the fees right now. So a temporary stop collecting fees, again, just to, to lessen these uh, social interactions with people. But it is challenging to try to, as a, uh, Joe was saying, when you have new people coming into the community center that aren't regulars, they don't know where to go and they don't know the process and the procedures and it, it does get challenging. It certainly does. And, um, you know, Laura, um, one more question for you, just kind of a medical biology question, whatever. You know, how effective, you know, are the uh, masks that we're using in terms of um, preventing the spread and the contraction of COVID, you know, are, are the masks um, an effective way really to um, prevent, you know, um, in, inhaling or um, in your respiratory system, the, the virus in these situations where, where you're outdoors in a collection center, for example, or anywhere, if you're indoors, whatever, it doesn't matter, but you know, how, how effective do you feel that is? Um, I do think it's effective. I've been looking at recent studies that have been published and um, because this is a person to person droplet transmission, you know, the vast majority of um, virus is really gonna come from somebody's mouth or their nose. Um, and so if we can cover that, um, we're really gonna prevent it, you know, being transmitted to a, a wider field. Um, probably all of you know that the N95 and surgical masks do the best job in terms of preventing that, um, but those are being reserved for um, healthcare frontline um, workers. And I will say that they are at the greatest risk for infection given, given their jobs. So recent studies have shown that um, even homemade masks can offer significant protection, though they are they offer less protection than medical grade masks. So, you know, some mask is better than no mask. And this is sort of um, the hierarchy of homemade masks <laughs> is that, um, you know, if you can make a mask out of a HEPA filter, that's best than using just regular homemade bed sheets that are between 80 and 120 counts, um, using canvas that is between 0.4 and 0.5 millimeters thick. Uh, then the use of shop towels is sort of the next best. And then sort of finally, the, 
would be 100% cotton that most of us are making homemade masks with sort of layered up. And that would be sort of my final level of um, materials that I think would, would, that have been shown in some recent scientific studies to work the best. All masks need to be worn properly in order for them to be effective. So they need to cover both the mouth and the nose and they need to be as tight to the face as you can get them um, while still um, allowing you to breathe um, like you should be. And it should be noted that masks should not replace social distancing and that using masks with social distancing is going to be the most effective way to prevent um, the spread. And the reason why masks are important is um, there's varying data that suggests that between 50 to 80 percent of people who are infected with COVID-19 are what we call asymptomatic or low symptomatic. So either they just never have symptoms, they never feel sick, or their symptoms are so mild that they don't recognize that they might be infected. And if, and if they're not wearing masks, then potentially um, they're putting other people at risk. So that's the importance of wearing um, uh, PPE and, and glasses as well. So all of your folks who are wearing um, protective glassware um, in your facilities, those are also protecting them from COVID infection as well. Great, thank you for, for running through that. I know we all have a lot of questions about that. And, and um, you know, we're approaching the end here and we cannot go over our, our time. So, um, gosh, so uh, much we have learned. Um, at least I feel uh, we've heard so much good information here. We have a poll up right now. Uh, what's the biggest takeaway um, for you from, from this webinar? So please do uh, fill that out as we, uh, as we wrap up. One final question for all of our panelists. Um, what is um, something uh, positive that you feel has come out of this situation? Um, I'm gonna start with Patrick. Um, in your assessment, what, give us something positive real quick because we have very little time. Yeah, I would just say our, our staff really feel valued. You know, it's, it's something to be called essential. And, uh, you know, I think they look at their work a little bit differently than they used to. And, uh, you know, speaking personally, coming here every day, if, um, you know, if nothing else, it's a distraction. So I'd rather be focused on tons per hour and uptime than, mm -hmm. you know, mortality rates from a pandemic. So, uh, you For know, sure. work can be a, a nice distraction at times. But bottom line, <laughs> I think our, our staff are glad to feel, feel uh, valued and essential. Wonderful. And Joe, real quick, a couple seconds. We don't have too much time left. Well, uh, I'd, I'd like to reiterate, it's, it's the frontline staffing. We could not do this without the dedication of the frontline employees who are interacting with the customers every day, the people running the plants every day. Um, the rest of us behind the scenes, we plan and make things happen, but we cannot do it without them. And their dedication and enthusiasm to um, put up with the, the long extended hours um, is admirable. Um, mm -hmm. And so that would be the, uh, the biggest takeaway for me. Great. And Bob, real quick, uh, share with us your, your positive takeaway. I would say that our communication amongst each other has improved the Employees, our, our coworkers, they they are feeling loved by our citizens and the camaraderie of the guys and girls, um, the men and women. Sorry, working folks, together. Folks. <laughs> Definitely, <And laughs> Tracy. Tracy, your words uh, of positivity at the end of this. Do we still have you, Tracy? We may have lost Tracy. Let's go to Alex uh, real quick, if you can. Uh, yeah, I would just like to piggyback on the employees. Um, I'm really grateful for the uh, our local governments and their constant communication with me and just their openness to, you know, tell me the info. So I'm really grateful for all of them. That's great. Thank you so much. And Laura, um, I'm sure that you're um, seeing some positives here too in, in the way that our nation is reacting. Can you share a quick, very, very quick word on that? Um, well, I've been gratified that now people know that public health is so important. So my 
then I feel good about that. But um, that, you know, we, those of us in public health have said it's an, a part of everything. It's even a part of recycling and waste management. And so I think that that's really important to know now that, you know, all of our systems are connected and we need each other. We need to communicate to each other. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right, we have just a few seconds left. So we have a final uh, poll that's going on. Please fill this out. What recycling topics would you like to see covered in the future, in the near future by this webinar series? Please fill that out. You can keep filling it out even when the webinar is over. Um, I wanna thank our panelists, our wonderful partners. Um, I wanna thank RRS for your partnership um, as we look at these poll results until we get cut off <laughs> by, uh, by the webinar timer. Um, you know, we want to continue offering this series and, uh, and we just appreciate your time and expertise so much. This webinar will be available, this recording will be available online very soon. And um, if there are any additional questions, you can contact us. Um, anytime and we will try to connect you with uh, any panelists that you have questions for and, and get the answers um, that you need. So everyone be safe, be well, keep filling out the poll, um, but be safe and, and be well. Um, we miss you and uh, we will talk to you again very soon. Thank you so much again and, and everyone have a great day. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, guys.